Welcome to episode number 41 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan. Thank you very much for joining me today. If you have been following me on Instagram or YouTube, you would have seen the launch of the Better Care Challenge. Now, the Better Care Challenge was something that TC Houston from the Reptile Mountain created. It was his idea. He came to me and asked uh, if I would be the first person for him to challenge. Of course, I absolutely accepted. I love the idea for this challenge. So basically, if you're not aware of what it is, I I just recommend going to TC's channel. That's the Reptile Mountain to see his video. But basically, it's something similar to, you know, like an ice bucket challenge where I myself make one small improvement in my reptile room, one tiny thing, doesn't matter what it is, one small thing that's going to increase the welfare of my animal, and then I go ahead and I challenge somebody else. So if you want to watch my video where I add UVB for my boas, and then you can hear who I who I challenge in that video, but this is starting to take off. I'm starting to see lots of people use the hashtag on Instagram, and I really encourage you to do this as well. So I'm challenging challenging all you guys, my listeners, to take part in the Better Care Challenge. Post a picture or a quick video on Instagram or Facebook using the hashtag better care challenge just quickly explain in the in the caption or in the video what you did and and then of course try to challenge one of your friends to do the same and I've been just trying to repost these on my story on Instagram just this is how we make the hobby better this is how we make the reptile industry level up and we can all take responsibility for the industry of on our own and I, I love this idea so I was super grateful that TC asked me to be involved and I hope that you guys want to participate as well. If you're not following me on Instagram right now, you can follow me at at animals at home CA, CA as in Canada on Instagram and uh, give me a follow there. If you are interested in supporting the podcast, you can go to animalsathome.ca slash shop and pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater and $5 does get donated to ARC, which is the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy or just sharing the content on Facebook or Instagram is a huge benefit to me and I really, really appreciate that. And of course, if you want to leave a review or a rating on the iTunes podcasting app, that is an amazing benefit as well. And before we jump into today's episode, I want to thank our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. As always, there are links in the show notes and the description. You can head over there. And if you do end up purchasing something for your animal, a small commission does come back to me, which of course helps support the show. If you are interested in learning more about this company, you should head over to Snake Discovery because Snake Discovery has also just made a partnership with Custom Reptile Habitats. And Paul, who is the owner of Custom Reptile Habitats, is going to help them build their zoo that they're working on right now. This zoo looks incredible. It's a giant facility that I think will be open later this year and the, the video that I do recommend going to check out if you haven't already seen it is where the three of them go down to Texas and go down to Universal Rocks and they chat with Stuart from there and they end up looking at all these different products and Paul the owner of Custom Reptile Habitats is there and he, he's in the video and describes some of the products that they sell and whatnot so if you do want to put a face behind the brand of Custom Reptile Habitats definitely go check out that video and of course go check out their website because everything you ever need for your animal is going to be there. Joining me on the podcast today is Drew Reeves. Now, Drew is the admin on one of, or the largest chameleon Facebook group, Chameleon Central. They have 23,000 plus members. But the interesting thing that they have is they have a group of 20,000 plus members that functions well. Now, those two things do not typically go together. Reptile Facebook group and functioning well are usually completely on the opposite ends of the spectrum. And if you watched the video I posted out last week, I sort of explained some of those major issues we have with Facebook groups, of course, echo chambers being one of the biggest ones. But this episode is for anybody who is wanting to start a Facebook group and wants to learn how to manage a group properly. The, the group that Drew has is really incredible. They have some amazing tips to, to allow these groups to function properly. They have some very, you know, they don't have a ton of rules. The rules they do have are heavily enforced and it allows for open discourse without people going crazy and calling each other names and they're not having to boot people out every five seconds. And it's, 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 it's truly a feat to be able to get these groups to function properly. I know there are other good groups out there as well, but they I feel like they are few and far between. So my hope is that someone will listen to this episode and go create a Facebook group on their own using some of these skills and, and tools that Drew talks about in order to make them function well. And the other thing we talk about is Drew's rescue. He has a, a ton of animals that he's collected over the last few years just because it, this man has a massive heart when it comes to to the reptile industry in general. And it, it is really inspirational, the amount of work that he does, both with the Facebook group and the animals that he's caring for at home. So I, I really do hope you enjoy this episode and uh, I will let Drew take it from here. <laughs> and that's the crazy thing is, is people, it, the first thing people say is, how long have you been doing this? And we've only been doing it for about six years. Um, prior to that, I'm 50 years old. So, I, you know, as well into my 40s. 
prior to that, never had any reptile experience, um, came from a saltwater fish background. So it, it, kind of the same skill set that you need for saltwater fish is the same thing that translates into keeping chameleons and tegus and things like that. So um, it came naturally to me. It wasn't that big of a deal. But how we got started was uh, my daughter was 14 years old at the time, went to Petco, decided that she wanted a chameleon to because they were the cutest thing in the world. And I knew where this was going. Um, so uh, she lost interest like most 14 year old girls would, uh, you know, probably in two months. Uh, we got smitten with her. Um, we made a bunch of stupid mistakes right off the bat. Um, she ended up developing MVD. Uh, and, and that's kind of what started me on um, the campaign to, uh, help others basically to, you know, to not let people get in the same situation that we got into. Um, at one time we probably had 20 chameleons in house. Um, it, it, we've, as they've passed from old age or whatever, uh, we just ended up not replacing them, but I, I've kept, uh, Mellori, pygmies, um, jacks, fishers, uh, veils, of course, panthers, uh, several different varieties of, of chameleons. And uh, so it's given me a lot of experience. And, and uh, uh, out of necessity, we kind of learned how to rehab them. Um, the, the vet taught us uh, how to do sub-Q fluids, um, do injections. I keep meds on hand. Um, so a lot of that kind of stuff is, is almost a necessity when you're doing what we're doing because – you know, you can't drag them into the vet every time something's wrong. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we do. We take them to the vet when it's warranted. But, uh, you know, if I notice a chameleon's got, you know, it's looking a little dehydrated, we could pop them with sub-Q fluids. Um, if they don't, you know, start getting better, then, you know, then we'll take them in and get a fecal float or whatever uh, done, try and figure out what's wrong with them. But um, I can't tell you how many animals I've saved just by having basic skills um, that, that, uh, that the vets and the vet techs have taught us. So it's really helped out a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So you had keeping reptiles, not even really crossed your mind. Obviously you're in the fish world. Did, was reptiles not on the radar at all? And then it just sort of blew up once you fell in love with that first one. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. I, you know, I, prior to that, I, they never really interested me any, um, but yeah, I kind of, I kept reef tanks, um, you know, did some fish only tanks, did some reef tanks, ran some corals, uh, some of those things. But, you know, I kind of likened chameleons to saltwater fish. You know, they're, they're one of those animals that, uh, you know, when people say, oh, I'd like to hold them and I want to do it. No, think of them like saltwater fish. You know, they're pretty to look at, you know, leave them alone. Don't stress them. Uh, so it, it, I kind of likened chameleons to, to the saltwater world, really. <laughs> Yeah. And chameleons do have obviously a slightly higher level of care for, for, for the most part. And that, I mean, I, it's kind of like in dart frogs in a way where people typically are very good at keeping dart frogs just because they are slightly sensitive. Now, I, obviously there's tons of chameleons that are in, in rough shape as well, but it almost forces you to do a better job on husbandry in, in some ways. Yes, it does. It, it's because it's not, you know, honestly, snakes to us are just stupid easy. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I just... I look at them and think, you know, I feed this guy once a week, once every two weeks. I make sure they got water. I clean out their enclosure. But, you know, for the most part, you just leave a snake alone. You don't really do too much. But, you know, when you're talking about chameleons where you got to worry about supplements, you know, how much they're getting, you got to make sure that you're replacing UVB bulbs um, consistently, uh, that, that, you know, the misting's correct, that they're not developing upper respiratory infections. <laughs> there's just, and there's, there's so many things and that that can go wrong. Um, there's too many variables that could go wrong, but um, to really do it successfully, you have to really be able to read the animals because uh, you know, as, as most reptiles are uh, gosh, by the time you recognize things are going South on you, then most of the time it's too late. Uh, so, so you gotta, you, you gotta be able to, to, to see those little subtle changes in them um, that, that will indicate something's going on. Is there something specific about the chameleons that really drew you to them? Or was it that extra challenge that sort of associated you associated with the saltwater fish almost? Well, you, you know what? I, I, at the time when we got into it, I didn't realize what they required. So it was kind of like trial by fire. Um, right. I, I didn't, I didn't intentionally do it. I didn't say, Hey, I'm going to go out and get the most difficult to keep, 
you know, reptiles there are, uh, and start at the very top like that because <laughs> that was not intentional, <laughs> not right. at all. <laughs> yeah, the, it, yeah. Sometimes you wonder, and maybe you have an opinion on that, if whether or not you think that they should be sold up front in pet stores like that because they are fairly challenging. Yes, I, I really wish they would not sell them. I mean, you know, okay, I get cresties and I get bearded dragons and I, you know, leopard geckos and. Those are things that are, you know, you, you can teach somebody how to keep those animals uh, in 20 minutes. You know, I mean, I, I can sit down and I can go over the basics of a leopard gecko and, and have you set up and run in and, and keep the animal going for 15 years. I, it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, chameleons are just a whole different ball game, And I, I really honestly wish they would just quit selling them. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those animals that should really just be left to the breeders almost to, to make sure yes. that they're selling them to the right people. Exactly, exactly. So I have said, I think several times, at least on the podcast, that I'm not 100% convinced that Facebook and social media is a net positive on the hobby. And it, obviously, there are some great things on, on Facebook, and there is some positives, but there's so much negative, I always wonder if it actually outweighs the positive. So I'm hoping that you can convince me otherwise today. So obviously, you are the primary admin on one of the larger, is it, I don't know if it's the largest chameleon Facebook group, or it's one of them anyway. Yeah, we're actually the largest chameleon specific group on Facebook and it's chameleon central. So we just surpassed 23,000 members. Um, so I, I, I'll give you a little history behind that. Um, I, I had a friend up in St. Louis that, um, had started the group. His name's Dustin Blevins. Uh, he had started chameleon central USA before I even got involved with chameleons. Um, it was, it was fairly new. He had maybe couple of thousand members, something like that. And we're talking like five years ago. Um, and, and when I kind of got involved um, in the group was where I actually learned a lot of what I needed to learn in order to successfully keep chameleons. Um, at that time, the chameleon groups and gosh, just they were, it was like the wild west. I mean, it, it was literally like people out in the street shooting at each other. every day. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was that bad. Yeah. And, and, and I think Dustin just got to the point where he was like, you know, I, I just, I, I'm, I don't want to deal with this. It's too much. Um, I, I don't like the dynamics of it. Um, and he asked me, he said, you know what, if you want it, Drew, you go ahead and take it over. And, and I, like I said, there might've been 2,000, 2,500 members. Um, and that was five years ago. So now we're up to like 23,000. So, um, I ended up coming in and, and a lot of people called me like the sheriff, you know, because I came in and I started booting people left and right. And I really didn't want to do that, but I had to get rid of the, um, the major troublemakers. I mean, they were, they were just people that were, um, they were long-term breeders and things that, um, they, they had a click, you know, and if you didn't fit into their click, they, they would just roast people for asking just basic questions, you know, you know, what kind of lighting, well, you should know what kind of lighting to use and blah, blah. It just, just, it was horrible. I mean, just people treating each other like trash. Um, so I came in and I, I literally cleaned house. I booted a ton of people. Um, things started to calm down and, um, uh, I started finding people that were kind of a like mindset that I had. Um, and brought them on as admins and in, in uh, my admin team has changed drastically as time goes on. Um, we've added, um, I, you know, I added a diverse group of people. Um, and they're not necessarily people who I would say are experts in chameleons. And I by no means an expert. I, I don't claim to be, uh, I, I can just tell you what experiences I have. Um, but they're people that are good at managing other people. A lot of them are. So, um, it, it's a matter of, of having, you know, people who have the same kind of mindset that, uh, you know, I, I, I continually tell the group, it's not, it's not the admins that, that make the group. It's the members that do. Um, I, and I kind of think of it as being, you know, it's a giant ship and, and out in the ocean. And it takes a ton of people to run it. And I'm just up here steering it. That's it. You know, I mean, but I can't steer it without having uh, great admins and, and great members um, because it just doesn't work if you don't do that. Um, you'll see on Chameleon Central, I built kind of a culture of uh, 
when somebody asks a question, you're going to see a whole bunch of people jump in and offer good advice. Uh, and, and I just sit back and watch it happen. Um, as long as the advice is that's being given out is, uh, you know, in line with, uh, you know, kind of what we lay out as, as care for them. Uh, we just let them go. And, and it works 99% of the time. I mean, sure. Every once in a while, uh, you, you hit, uh, there's jerks everywhere. You know, I mean, I don't care what you're doing. It's, it's a cross section of society uh, that are coming from, you know, not only across the United States, but I mean, we've, I've got Canadian admins and we have a lot of Canadian members. Um, And, and they just, you know, I mean, there's jerks everywhere. (laughs) Definitely. And they just uh, want to cause trouble. Yes. They want to cause trouble. And they're, they're looking to, you know, they're looking to push people's buttons. Uh, you got to know how to handle them. Uh, I've got 30 something years in the army reserve and, and I was an instructor. Uh, so I, I, I learned a lot about human nature and how to handle people. Let's put it that way. So um, I, I know when to put my, my foot up their rear and I also know when to tactfully uh, handle someone. So uh, that, that helps out a lot. Oh, definitely. I mean, and, and just being able to tactively handle most things is really the way you make things positive. I mean, there are the trolls yes. out there that need to get a kick in the ass <laughs> to get out. No, but, without but, a doubt. <laughs> but, but there are so many people that are just naive because they're not because they, they're not in the they've been in the hobby for maybe two days like maybe they want to get a chameleon and they don't know that yeah. and and so many so many of us who have been in the hobby for long enough just almost forget what it's like to not know anything and and then we look at the question and we go well, wow that person is such an idiot for asking totally forgetting that if you wind the clock five years like i don't know what anything is you know yeah yes yes very much so and so uh, with with people like that so we have developed um in in the group files uh, we've developed units where, uh, so the, like all the information for Jackson's chameleons in one place, everything for a veil, everything for a Panther. But then we have other files that, that go into lighting and, and, you know, it might, there's one that addresses supplements, um, and, and Guler edemia. There's just so many different things, um, that, that we just keep adding to. And that has helped drastically, uh, you know, so we can reference people there. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a hell of a lot of resources that you can use now. I, I'm Facebook has they've come a long way in uh, making it better for these kinds of groups. Uh, when you know when I first started, it was gosh, it was so haphazard. Everything was just kind of thrown together. Uh, now it's much more structured, um, and you can put those um, less basically lessons up uh, that people can access anytime. So. Uh, it's just getting them pointed in the right direction and, and showing them where the resources are. Yeah, and, and and nurturing those people. Like we want them to be involved in the industry and we don't want to scare them off. And and then the biggest thing that I always kind of, not even chuckle, it's a more more of an annoyance when you see people get roasted online. The, the thing that suffers in the end is the animal that's being cared for the individual that doesn't know how to do it. And they're leaving that group not only not knowing what to do, but also very, very hurt to the point where they may not ever go back to ask another question. That's right. And, and the animal in the long run suffers that. And I have made that very clear many times that I will handle people, peace, people tactfully, but my ultimate goal is the welfare of the animal. I don't care about your feelings. If I upset you, I'm sorry that I upset you, but I am going to tell you what needs to be said for the benefit of that animal. Um, and the admins all know that that's the way I do things and, and, and they're right on board with it too. I mean, yeah, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to run people off, but if you're not going to listen and you're not going to make changes, um, and, and you're going to be a jerk about it. I I mean, ultimately I'm going to say, you know, I feel sorry for your animal. I really do. Um, because ultimately the decisions that you're making right now are probably going to lead to the death of your animal. And that's, that's not good. That's not good for anybody involved. Yeah, it's 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 very funny because some people will dig their heels in and go, "Well, this is what I've been doing, so this is fine." And I, it's something that I I believe that as human beings, we're not the best at communicating through typing on a keyboard. Clearly, like we've made that very obvious over the last probably ten years of online communication. So it's you know yes. people, 
you you behave in a way that's totally different than you would if you were having a face to face conversation. You know, like it's 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 crazy that if you had somebody giving you advice that you would just go, oh, I'm not going to listen to that, even though there's yeah. a bunch of evidence and this is why this is how everybody else does it. It's a very strange world. Yes, it is. And, 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 you know, just like I took that, brought you downstairs and showed you everything. And if I had someone that I was trying to coach and, and, and mentor and show them, I guarantee if they were face to face with me and we were standing there in that basement and I was showing them exactly what it takes to be successful, they, they would listen. But for some reason, when they get behind a keyboard, they think, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't have to listen to you. And, and I, I, you don't have to act like a jerk either. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so do you guys have certain rules that, that you follow or that you have uh, as, as part of the group that, that helps keep things structured? So what we ask people to do is, is that if there's an issue, we ask for one of the admins to be tagged in it. If one of, them's, if one of us gets tagged in it or they report a comment, um, I can assure you that that's like setting off, you know, it's like setting off red fireworks up in the air. Uh, one of us will grab it. Um, I even have one of my admins, Lee Jackson, uh, works overnights on an army post, um, dispatching like fire and police. And, uh, so she's got nothing but time most of the time. Um, so she pays attention overnight. Um, I mean, we literally have somebody that's paying attention pretty much around the clock. So when one of those things gets reported, we'll jump on it really quick. And, and if we see someone getting torn up, uh, we'll shut down commenting and we'll message that person and say, Hey, look, let's take this, um, you know, let's take this into a private message and let me mentor you one-on-one. -on -one. So if one of us admins can't do it um, just because we don't have time or whatever, then uh, I will hook them up with someone uh, that can do one-on-one -on -one with them. So we do a lot of promotion of that mentorship. Um, the Facebook mentorship program is absolutely horrible. Um, I, I don't care for it at all. It's just easier for, uh, for me to say, Hey, if you want a mentor, tell me what you're looking for. You know, that I, I'm looking, you know, to keep this particular breed. I will find someone that has experience with that. I will get you hooked up with them and you can go one-on-one -on -one and answer, you know, get all the questions answered you want. Now you have to be careful with doing that too much because we like some stuff to be public because people won't learn from it if there's not a public record of it. Um, so if you take everything to private message, then sometimes that's, I mean, that's good, but, um, also there's no, uh, you know, there's no record of it. People learn by a lot of people are lurkers. Uh, they want to stand back to the back and, and just kind of read what's happening and they learn a lot and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, um, heck I do that myself in a lot of the groups. I, I'll go through and search for, okay, so I think my tech is doing this. So I, I'll search for that. And then read what other people say. Uh, you know, there's not everybody's going to post. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. So it's good to be able to strike a balance between having a public discourse. And I actually like that idea of a mentorship that probably gives some people a little more comfort in asking questions yes. that there may be. So how, how you were saying there's the, I didn't even realize Facebook actually has a mentorship program. program. What, what it's, is a hor <laughs> it's a horrible program. It's terrible. It, it's, um, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do a good job. It's more like a counseling type thing. Um, how do you feel about this, this type, you know, and I'm like, that's not what we're doing here. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, I guess for some things it would work, but, um, you know, when you're talking about taking care of animals and all that kind of stuff, it's just not the right thing. Um, so it's, we, we used it for a while. Um, people could volunteer to be mentors. And then you could go in and request a mentor. Uh, but I just tell people now, look, if you want a mentor, make a post. Uh, I guarantee you that, and, and I'll tell you probably 75, 80% of the time, um, one of us admins doesn't even have to jump in on it. If someone makes a post and says, hey, I, you know, I've got experience with veils, but I want to do Jackson's Chameleons. Uh, can somebody help me with that? And then I guarantee you, some one of the other members will say, you know, raise their hand and say, look, I'll help you. That that's not a problem. I'll PM you. Well, what we'll, you know, we'll make things work out. So, um, it, this gets me back to the, you know, what makes this group great is, is it's not us. It's not the admins. It's, it's the members. I mean, they, when I see stuff like that, I just smile and I kick back and just walk away from it because, you know, as a, when you're trying to lead something, you can't do everything. I mean, obviously you've got to set up the groundwork for, 
uh, making the group self-sufficient. And that's, you know, that's what we've done. We've done a lot of that. Yeah. And it's, it's really impressive because 23 plus thousand members, like I feel like once groups hit that plus 10,000 or so is when they start hitting the ditch. And, and there's a, I mean, I mean, I, Again, I hate to throw ball pythons under the bus. I always do that by accident. But but their groups are <laughs> <laughs> their oh groups are, are just brutal. It's crazy how bad the ball python groups can be. I, I people just getting kicked out all the time for even asking questions, and it's so. Oh, yeah. where, where are those groups going wrong? So I, I mean, it's because they just they don't open their minds up. They're they're literally just sitting there saying that if you come in here and you say you're going to do this, they'll just boot you. I mean, instead of. Uh, saying, you know what, welcome, come on in, and let us show you some different ways to do things. Uh, they don't do that. Um, the ball python groups are horrible, like you mentioned. Bearded dragon groups, oh, my God. Some of the bearded dragon groups are just, they're brutal also. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, and, and that's, I, you know, I don't know about in other animal groups. I, You know, I'm I, most of the groups that I'm involved in, almost all of them are reptiles. Uh, but I would say that the ball python groups and the bearded groups are just horrible. But yes, they get a mindset of, uh, you know, if you're coming, if you're going to come in here and you're going to do this, we're kicking you. We're going to boot you. <laughs> what the hell good does that do? That does, yeah. that does nobody any good. You know? It's like ideal, like they have this ideology that they, that you have to subscribe to. And in those groups often have like 20 or 30 rules. Like when you sign in, they're like read like pages and pages of rules and, and you don't even know how to post every day is a different type of post. And it's just very convoluted. Yes, it is. Um, and I forgot to mention one thing that, that we do as an admin group is we have a group chat um, on Facebook messenger that is continually going all the time. Um, it, all of the admins are members of it. Um, we post on there. Uh, so we'll discuss things. Um, so if there's a particular post that we say, Hey, we need to watch this one because I think it might go south on us. Um, you know, we can look at it and somebody can jump in real quick and, and make comments. So there's a lot of behind the scenes type stuff that goes on. Um, we also, and, and I'm probably revealing some secrets here that I don't need to, but it's okay. I don't <laughs> mind. Uh, we also have group. We also have another admin group that's a secret group that uh, we keep track of troublemakers. So what we do is we'll make a post and we'll hashtag that person so that they're easily searchable. Um, so if someone's causing a bunch of problems and and they're not really at the point where you know, well, we want to boot them, but we want to watch what type of advice they're giving or uh, they're just being asses. Um, it, 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 we'll keep track of that. So, so, so we do have a way of keeping track of that, um, you know, through the group chats and, and also in the, in our separate admin group that, uh, uh, that we maintain to, you know, keep track of people. So if someone periodically, you'll have people that'll pop up, um, they'll cause a bunch of problems and they'll disappear. And then six months later, they show back up and you're like, man, that name sounds familiar to me. And the guy sounds like an ass. And it sounds like I've heard this kind of person before. So we'll go back to the other group. We'll search it and say, oh, yeah, that's what happened. So Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably smart. You can kind of keep track of everybody. And yeah, it's it's too easy for people to be crazy on there. I, I mean, you see a lot of personal attacks too, which always surprises me that at, like adults are calling each other names uh, within the first comment. You know, it's like, wow, you're an idiot. How stupid could you be? And it, it's, it's really bizarre. It's actually the way kids communicate you know when they're around 11 or 12 very much so and we and that is one thing that will get us involved in a heartbeat so when we see that type of stuff going on um, we have a culture in the group of you know if if a member sees that type of stuff if we're not um, if they don't see an admin involved in it they will tag one of us or they'll report it and we will we can mute people uh, you know, we can come in and we can say, look, that, you know, we don't do that. We don't talk like that to one another. Um, there's no reason for it. And, and, and some people are just hot heads and you got to let them cool down. So, you know, you, move, you, you mute them for 24 hours. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get booted. Uh, to be honest with you, we very rarely boot people. I mean, uh, I'm going to say that if we boot two people a month, that's probably a lot. Wow. Uh, we do, a, we'll do a lot of muting of people um, and we can shut down comments. Um, and I understand people can, can be hotheads and say things that 
uh, you know, maybe, maybe they otherwise wouldn't say because they get so passionate about the animals um, that that they think that that's the way to handle it. Uh, you know, we might just PM the person and say, look, man, you can't do that. Uh, you know, you're not doing anybody any good. And you're definitely, I understand you're passionate and you want to do what's right for the animal and you want that person to do what's right for the animal, but you're not getting anywhere by calling them an asshole or saying, you know, you're stupid for doing that. That's, that's not getting anywhere. And, and 90% of the time they'll back down real quick. Um, and if they don't, the drill sergeant in me kicks in and I, you know, I might tell him, look, ass, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I'm not going to tolerate this. I got thick skin and, and you can attack me all you want to, but you're not going to do it in my group. You know, I mean, if you feel the need to PM me behind the, and call me whatever you want to call it, by all means, go ahead and do it. Just don't do it in my group. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between being stern with the person to, to give them the advice, especially if there's someone that's not listening to the advice given. But then another whole thing is to attack them, you know, personally, because it, like you said, it doesn't help anybody. And then you still have the chameleon in the background who's dehydrated with under a red lamp or something. And that's right. And that's he, exactly it's the it. one suffering. Yeah. So, he's under complex fluorescent and, and has MBD and has fallen off the vine. You know, I mean, that's, that's, and that's what makes us sick. And, and, uh, all of the admins, uh, you know, by God, if you need help, we will jump through hoops to help you. I mean, we will take you into to PMs. I, I, I have sent feeders to people at my own expense. I've had feeders drop shipped to them. Um, I've had, you know, I've had other admins do the same type of thing. Um, we'll go, if you're willing to listen and you're willing to accept the help, we will go whatever distance it takes to do it. Uh, and, and that's, I, I would say that probably is what sets us apart from a lot of the other groups. You know, we, we actually give a damn, you know, we, we, we want to do what's right. Which is impressive considering the size of the group. Like that's, that's a big undertaking. Yeah. And the pay sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Facebook isn't sending you checks or. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I, yeah, I always you don't said get that, that six figure salary is just not there. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and yeah, it's going to be a lot of time to so if somebody wants to start a Facebook group, they actually need to to set aside a good amount of time to be able to manage it, I'm sure. Yes, it, it takes a tremendous amount of time. Um I you know, one of these days I'm going to have uh all of my admin team kind of keep track of, on a weekly basis how much time uh they spend answering PMs, uh, you know, posting, um and commenting on posts and and I I bet you that between the group of us, it's dozens of hours. I mean, it's a lot of time. It really is. Yeah. Well, that obviously is, is one of the things that makes the difference, I guess. Is, is, is there anything you guys did to allow the group to grow so large or is that just something that's happened slowly over time? Gosh, it just happened slowly over time. And, um, but it, it seems like every three months or so we're adding another thousand members. Um, so it's, it's growing at a tremendous rate. Um, I think that it's one of those things where, you know, when you're looking for a group, you look for the large group because you're thinking, oh, well, that's where everybody else is. So I'm going to get the best advice there. So um, that's not always the case, but I think that's what drives a lot of people to it is when they, you know, they do a search for chameleon groups and we're probably at the top of it. Uh, so, you know, we're going to get first, you know, first run with them. Um, I would say that, you know, gosh, I, I'm not going to say we're an advanced group because we are. There's a lot of, uh, there are a few um, advanced chameleon groups that are for some one of the more advanced species and all that. We're kind of viewed as the newbie group, um, you know, to, to help the new keepers um, or the casual keepers that, you know, have one or two chameleons. And that's great. I'm fine with that. Um, you know, my goal is to get people started on the right foot. Uh, as they learn and they want to, uh, you know, move into a group that Chris Anderson's in, uh, you know, or, or some of the some of the experts, then, uh, you know, by all means, move into them. You know, I mean, uh, we're we're your gateway drug is what we yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And in yeah. reptile world, that's dangerous because <laughs> the yes, collection yes. expands. But that's, that's right. Is, then you end up with a basement like I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, th but that is exactly what we need is, is you, because reptiles can be complicated and you can make them more complicated 
by the level of care you provide them. But you don't really want to start somebody with a crazy bioactive enclosure that's, you know, takes forever to set up and you're, they're going to lose their animal with a RI or something. And you want to give them those basics and, and get yeah. them on a good foundation. And then after maybe six months, if they feel comfortable, then they can broaden their, their, their level of care. Yeah, you got to get them started on understanding the physiology of the animal, that they're literally solar powered, that, uh, you know, that UVB is vitally important, that a, a very diet is is important, that supplements are drastically important. So you got to get them started on the right road. Yes, I'm not going to tell somebody, hey, go out and get yourself a Jackson and set them up in a bioactive enclosure and do this, this, and this, because it's not the place to start. It, it, it's it, you. It's a, it's, uh, you know, in the army, we talk, uh, uh, when we're doing training, it's crawl, walk, and then we run. Right. So we, we learn how to crawl, we learn how to walk, and then we learn how to run. And that's a good way to, uh, you know, to approach it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is there, I guess there are the fair share of chameleons that do end up in, you know, poor conditions, I, I would assume. I mean, obviously your basement is full of rescues. Is it, is it, are most people, is there a sort of a mistake that people are making with chameleons for the most part, like these, these newbies that come in? Is it lighting? Is it, or just kind of a combination of a bunch of different things? The vast majority of it is lighting and supplements. And I would say lighting is number one by far. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, companies like ZooMed make, uh, you know, a chameleon kit, which is absolutely worthless. Uh, we tell people, take it back and buy the proper stuff and you're not going to spend hardly any more money. Um, and what just floors me about ZooMed is they actually sell proper lighting. They sell a good T5 fixture. They sell Reptisun T5 high output bulbs that are made in Germany. They're good high quality bulbs. Uh, they sell the stuff that you need to be successful, but they put that kit together to, and you fail. We call it the death kit. Um, so what, what a, is in the kit? Is it, I think it's that screen enclosure, the zipper screen. Is it that one or? Well, it's no, it's, it's actually a mesh. It's a, it's an aluminum mesh enclosure, but it's too small. It's a, it's a Reptibreeze medium, which is 16 inches by 16 inches by 30 inches. Um, you know, we recommend at, at least the large, which is 18 by 18 by 36. Um, and, and I tell every people get an XL, get the two foot by two foot by four foot. Um, I don't care what species you're keeping, the bigger, the better. Um, uh, but, it comes with a 13 watt 5.0 compact fluorescent light that when you put a solar meter up underneath it, I mean, you literally have to be within an inch or two through the mesh in order to get a decent reading off of it. So wow. unless that animal is literally sitting right underneath that, it's not going to do them any good. And, and especially when you take a, uh, you know, an animal like a veiled that we recommend, you know, either a 10.0 or a 12% Arcadia, um, they're used to high UVB exposures. I mean, uh, their UV indexes that they live in are very high. Um, and, and so, uh, if you, if you start them out and they're growing and you know, they grow rapidly in that first year, they hit adulthood in the first year. Um, if you got them under crappy lighting, then, you know, if they make it to the first year, they've already, uh, they've already been kicked in the rear and, and given a crappy start. Um, you know, if they survive it to begin with. So uh, that's the first thing is lighting. Second thing is supplements. It's uh, incorrect use of supplements um, that they don't understand uh, when D3 should be used, when a multivitamin should be used, when a plain calcium should be used. Uh, so uh, we see a lot of D3 overdoses um, because once again, here we got, you know, ZooMed, uh, you know, sells Reptical. They have Reptical with D3 and without D3. And guess what they sell in Petco? And at PetSmart, they sell ZooMed with D3. They don't even have the plain calcium. So we end up seeing a lot of D3 overdose. So, uh, which it, then you, you know, that, that mimics when they get that, it mimics MBD uh, uh, symptoms. So, uh, you know, either way, it's just not good for them. I mean, it ultimately leads to an unhealthy animal or a slow, painful death. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's. I think vitamin, uh, like um, vitamin D hyper hyper vitaminosis and vitamin D is is a lot more rampant in the hobby than we, we think. And I actually had a scare with my day gecko, and I didn't even realize I was doing it because I was feeding her. She was feeding, uh, you know, bugs and whatnot, uh, worms and crickets and things. But I was also feeding her crested gecko diet, which has synthetic vitamin D, and I wasn't even thinking. And 
over time, she started, you know, she was really storing a lot of calcium in her neck and she started to display what to me looked like hyper or hypocalcemia. And I was, I was, it was really blowing my mind. And I, and then I was finally flipping through John Courtney Smith's book, the, his uh, reptile nutrition. And I realized, wow, the symptoms are identical between hyper and hypocalcemia. And That's right. vi- when you have too much vitamin D, it's going to look like that. And, and you're exactly right. We have these companies that are just se- sending people home with vitamin D and then these UVB lights and they poison their animal yes they do and and i and you mentioned john courtney smith that um arcadia is uh, in my opinion is the premier reptile company out there um they're doing things right uh john courtney smith is absolutely amazing He's a, uh, just a treasure trove of knowledge i mean every time the guy opens his mouth i'm like you know hey, yeah uh, what's he gonna say <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah exactly because so, i mean i learned stuff from him all the time and, and uh, as a matter of fact he was he was commenting on a post on chameleon central today uh and and they're doing stuff right and but and you know like companies like zoom med um it, it just floors me that they have the right stuff but they don't market it like they should you know i mean i go into pet stores and you uh, you, you still see the compact fluorescent UVBs in there, you, or you might see a Zilla T8 fixture. And I'm looking at the Zilla T8 fixtures thinking, my God, you know, you can buy a Zoomed T5 fixture with the bulb for five bucks more than that crap 18 inch fixture. You know, um, it, it, they're just not selling the right stuff. I mean, they've got it out there and it's available. They're just not selling the right stuff. Yeah. And for the the naive person that walks into the pet store who literally has no idea, everything looks like it must be good. Sure. Sure. It does. And and they don't understand that, you know, uh, uh, most of these diurnal reptiles, when I say they're solar powered, I mean, that's what I tell people. They're literally solar powered. And and if you don't understand that D3 cycle, you don't understand how calcium is, you know, is consumed in their body and processed in their body. I said, you're going to make a lot of mistakes Now you can spend 15 minutes and learn all about it. And, and, and it can be boiled down real quick, but folks don't want to do that because um, I think the problem is, is that, you know, when you get a dog, what, you know, what do you do for a dog? You put, you put water and food out for them and that's about it. I mean, what do you have to do for a dog or a cat? You, you don't have to make sure that they have the right lighting and the right supplements and all that stuff. Um, if you want them to live longer, you know, there's certain things that you can do, but for the most part, you put food and water out for them and they're good to go. Um, that, that's not the case with, you know, with reptiles. It's just not true. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. It's uh, it is interesting, especially when you have these kits and what, so do you guys have quite a few people that will come into the group and say, Hey, look, I just bought this uh, fantastic <laughs> kit. And, and then you oh, guys yeah. say, take that. I hope you didn't throw the receipt out. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what we tell them. Take it back to the store and then we're going to show you where to go buy the proper stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. And so obviously you were kind enough to show me your, the collection that you have downstairs before we started officially recording. And is, so has the rescue been, how did you fall into that? Was that just something that you just saw a need for and that you started tackling it? Yeah. And that's what we did. Um, it was just more of a need than anything else. So we're, we're kind of equal distance between St. Louis and, and Memphis, Tennessee. And the nearest uh, place that does anything like this is in St. Louis. So you're talking about 120 miles away. There was nothing in this area of, the, uh, uh, of Missouri and Tennessee and Illinois. Um, there was nobody doing it. And we kept, we kind of did it unofficially for a long time before we even called ourselves a rescue. Uh, you know, people would call for advice. Um, they would say, can you take this animal in? Um, and then about, I don't know, probably a year and a half ago or so, we decided, you know what, we're just going to slap rescue on the end and we're going to try to become official. And then, you know, we'll kind of go from there. Um, so it, it's something that's just evolved with time. Um, we're the ones that get the call for, I mean, we picked up a hedgehog. Somebody surrendered a hedgehog to us, you know, I mean, it's not anymore a reptile than my dog is it's a mammal uh, <laughs> yeah. but it seems like anything that's not a dog or a cat you know we get the phone call for them um we, we have a, a a vet clinic that's um in town that uh, they do a, they they see exotics they do a good job um we serve as a resource for them and they serve as a resource for us um so you know the doc that i work with understands that I know more about husbandry than he'll ever possibly know or want to know. 
Uh, and I understand that, you know, he's got DVM behind his name and, and he understands the physiology and biology behind the animals better than I'll ever know. Um, so we kind of work together. Um, you know, when I bring an animal in, you know, I'll say, Hey doc, I think it might be this, um, you know, and he'll say, Oh yeah, yeah. Let's, let's look that up and, you know, let's run some tests and see if that's, that's what it is. Um, so that's a good relationship. Um, I, I've got a good relationship with the Petco in town. The the store manager calls, you know, he'll call me and say, okay, this person came in with this leopard gecko and they have this, this, and this, what do you suggest? And so I'll tell him or, or he'll say, you know, is it okay to have him call you? Yes, most certainly have him call me. Uh, so, you know, we kind of developed some partnerships and relationships with the, you know, with the places around here that deal with reptiles. I can't like just by the sort of the scan of the basement. I'm not sure if you have a number of how many animals are down there, but there's quite a few. Is there like 30 plus or is it more than that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say it's probably pushing 40 somewhere yeah. around there. So is yeah. that overwhelming? Are you able to, are you able to, are the animals leaving as quickly as they come in? Probably not. No, no, they're not. Um, you know, things like leopard geckos and, and beardies are easy to get rid of. Chameleons are not easy to get rid of just because, you know, they come in and they look at it and they go, God, you know, I, I, I really don't want to devote that much to it. And, and so that scares them away. So chameleons are very difficult to get rid of. Um, the, and the aquatic turtles, I wish places, you know, people pull them out of the wild, uh, box turtles and, and, and red earth sliders and yellow belly sliders. Um, and, you know, we preach all the time, but leave them where they belong. Um, you know, take pictures of them. That's awesome. You know, if you're walking with your kid through the woods, uh, you guys see a box turtle, pick them up by all means, look at them, study them, uh, you know, get online and look up information on it, but put them back where you found them. Uh, because, you know, people will, will bring them in and then, you know, we get a call, uh, you know, Hey, can you come pick them up? Cause we really don't, you know, we can't, we can't watch them anymore. Or we don't want to spend any more money on them. And, and uh, so then I end up with a box turtle that I don't know where they came from. Um, so it ends up, you know, being kept in captivity for the rest of its life because uh, you, you know, the deal with box turtles that you, you can't just release them anywhere. Um, and, and same thing with aquatic turtles. Um, you know, they go to Florida, they pick up a couple of little yellow belly sliders and they come back to Missouri and yeah, they're all cute and all that stuff. But, you know, they grow rapidly and you need a big tank. And uh, next thing you know, they're, they're at my house. So. Yeah. yeah, And it did seem like you had quite a few turtles down there. Turtles are, are one of those species that uh, people that, that passionately keep turtles say they're fantastic pets. And I'm sure that they are. But the problem is, is that most people who get them are doing just like you say, they have them for a little while and they realize they don't have, I mean, you need a very large system to be able to hold a turtle and most yeah. people don't have that. You buy them as a quarter or, I mean, now you have to buy them a little bit bigger, but it still doesn't yeah. help. There's so many turtles that are in rescues. Oh yes. It's, it's insane. And I, and I wish they would, you know, I wish they quit selling them. You can go in, uh, you know, our local pet co's got yellow belly sliders in there right now. And I'm like, geez, please quit. Um, that and then you know some of the land-based some of the tortoises like your redfoots and sulcatas and all that stuff um gosh they just don't realize the commitment that it takes i mean you know we took on ducky um is she's a 12 year old sulcata that um uh, a lady up in st louis um took on got her as a hatchling um so we happen to know when you know what months she was hatched um uh, but then calls us because she can't handle her anymore because she weighs 40 pounds and she's got pyramiding and, you know, she didn't know uh, that they were going to get that big and all that. I mean, you know, you could spend five minutes on the internet and find out that that's probably not a good animal. I mean, uh, it's, you know, I tell people, I said, you can buy uh, a sulcata for, you know, hundred, 150 bucks when your baby's born and that animal's going to outlive your baby. Yeah. Um, you know, more than likely it's going to outlive your baby. So please don't take that lightly. You know, I mean, they're all, yes, they're awesome animals. They really are. They're fascinating, but you know, don't go buy one, find a rescue that has one and please have a plan for them. You know, my 13 year old son has already agreed to take, you know, the tortoises, uh, you know, I'm 50 years old. I mean, 
she's 12. She's going to grow for 30 and live for 80. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't buy a tortoise for some of those species and you're, you're it's going to outlive you no matter what. So there's, it's, yeah. it's, it's like you can't even possibly have an end game unless you have a, you know, a will situation set up. It's That's kind of right. crazy. I mean, and even, you know, even a red ear slider, you can get 30 years out of a red ear slider, you know? I mean, so I've got red ear sliders that are down there that are probably five or six years old. They're, you know, we'll probably die about the same time. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's definitely one of the, the issues with the reptile industry in general is that we do have some very long living species that that really shouldn't be I don't have any issue with people keeping them in captivity if, if they're captive uh, bred and raised and whatnot, but they shouldn't be easily accessible just because I, for that exact reason, you have a basement full of uh, crazy animals now. <laughs> yes. And, and and that's one of the things that drew me to your podcast was, is I was like, oh my gosh, this guy has the same philosophy and feeling about animals that I have, you know, that, um, uh, Let's not pull them out of the wild. Let's let's do you know. Let's do captive breeding. Let's learn about them and how to captive breed them, and and let's sell them to people that are going to be responsible with them. Um, you know, like you said, I don't have any problem with that, but you know, I I do have a problem with people bringing up you know yellow belly sliders from Florida when they're fifty cent size. You know. Yeah. Exactly. So in terms of your. And w with the rescue itself, financially, is that all burdened on you? Is that something that you have to, like, you don't have, do, do you have donations? Or are people able to do that? We get some donations, but uh, probably 95% of the costs are borne by us. Um, I would say that, you know, there are times when I, there, before I started keeping a lot of the animals outside during the summer um, and built the enclosures out there, there were times when my, utility bill was hitting 560 bucks a month. And I mean, and I don't live in that big of a house. Uh, so the energy, I would say between increased energy costs, um, feeders, we order from Gon's Cricket Farm, uh, who, who just does a fantastic job with helping out uh, breeders and rescues by uh, selling crickets literally below wholesale um, to us. Um, they're a blessing to us, but still we drop a bunch of money on crickets every month uh, but between vet bills increased utility bills having to replace uvb bulbs and all that stuff i would say that we spend probably an average of gosh six seven hundred dollars a month on average you know when it's when it's averaged out across the year i mean it's it's a pretty good hunk of change oh yeah I, it's uh i mean and then that does not even account for the time because it's not oh, yeah. like you must spend hours down there a day just just setting just finish doing the you know basic maintenance so so tara is tara is my wife and and she's as much into the reptiles as i am she just has just as much passion as i do she's just not as vocal about it as far as being out on social media and all that kind of stuff i'm kind of the face of it i guess uh but but there is absolutely no way that i could do uh all this stuff by myself because we get home at five o'clock and the lights are going off at seven we got two hours to knock stuff out um, and there, there were times that a lot of times we were sitting down to eat dinner at eight, eight thirty at night. Um, we, we kind of helped with that because I put a call out for volunteers, um, and, and did that about, I don't know, six or seven months ago. Uh, we just got, we literally got to the point where Tara and I looked at each other and said, we're killing ourselves and we can't keep doing this. Um, and that's when I put out a call for, uh, for volunteers and we have consistent number of volunteers that come over and help, um, you know, a, a few nights a week and it, God, has it made a hell of a difference. I mean, uh, you know, just having, uh, somebody come in and, you know, clean out some cages and drop some mice into snake enclosures and that type of stuff. I mean, it allows me to do the other stuff that I need to do, um, as far as building enclosures and, uh, all the other stuff that I, I was, I, it was just, it was taking up a tremendous amount of time. I mean, I, I would say that we were probably spending 20 plus hours a week doing it. Um, so we've gotten some relief in the last six or seven months, which has been awesome. So uh, why do it? Why, what, what compels you to, to, to do, to have a rescue and keep the animals? So I, 
you know, what really made me do it was the mistakes that I made with our first chameleon. Uh, I, I, once I figured out what I was doing wrong, I said, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to, to help people from becoming, you know, getting in the same situation that I did um, and putting an animal in that type of situation. So that's what really drives me. It's the animals. Um, you know, I, I, I love, um, you know, I, I, I love the interaction with other people and all that kind of stuff. And it's great. Um, we have people come over here all the time to our house um, it's almost every weekend we have visitors. Um, and I've had them drive. Uh, we had a guy that came and dropped stuff off that lived in Cincinnati. He drove seven hours one way to get here, um, uh, to drop off supplies for us and tour the place. Um, so, uh, you know, we love the interaction with the people and all that stuff, but it's the animals that we do it for. Um, it's just passion, you know, yeah. I mean, you've got it. You understand it. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, no, I, I get it. It's yeah, uh, it, it's it. amazing. Yeah, no, that's it's it's pretty special that you're doing that. I mean, that's a big undertaking. And do you have a place online where where people can see what animals you guys have in, so you can have people come? I'm I'm guessing you you do try to send these animals to good homes when you can. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's you can look up Reeves Reptile Rescue on Facebook. Um, we try to post up there um, pretty often, and uh, you know I get a lot of requests across there about you know what do you have for adoption and so on and so forth. Um, when we do adopt out, I vet the person as much as possible. You know, I tell them up front, look, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and you better return the right answers. <laughs> you know, uh, So I, I, and some of them, honestly, Dylan, man, I mean, some of them come from such horrible situations that I won't ever adopt them back out. Um, I've got a yellow belt or red ear slider down there. Um, a good sized female. She spent 13 years of her life in a 10 inch by 16 inch storage tote with six inches of water in it. No filtration, no UVB. How she survived, I have no clue. That girl is never going anywhere. She will stay in our possession forever because wow. I just, you, you, when they come from such horrible situations like that, I'm like, you know, my commitment to the animal is, is you'll never be in that situation again. So and the only way I can guarantee that is, is that I keep them, you know, I mean, that's, so there are animals that we end up, um, uh, we keep them until they die. I, I mean, I, there's been some, some just horrible, horrible situations and, you know, you, you could get upset about it. Um, people would say, Oh my God, I would go off on that person. But you know what I do? I look at them and I say, you did the right thing. You know, uh, you surrendered the animal. You did the right thing. See you later. And I, I have gone in and, and Tara, my wife can attest to this. I'm a big old guy. I'm six one and 250 pounds. And, uh, I've come out of houses with animals crying. I mean, just literally hold them and going, holy shit. You know, I mean, just, just unbelievable, horrid yeah. situations. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I walk out and I never see them again. And, we keep the animal until, you know, until they die. So, Well, that's the amazing thing about reptiles, and I've said it before, is their ability to suffer through an immense amount of adversity. Like some of these animals, you don't understand how they're still living, and they just keep yeah. going. Like I can't believe a turtle with no filtration, no UV. It's just like what is keeping that heart ticking? How did, how did she survive? How she survived? No clue. Absolutely no clue. I, I, I mean, and she was, was she in bad shape when we got her? Oh yeah. She had all kinds of stuck shit on her scoots and all that. Um, and, and we spent a while rehabbing her, but I mean, you know, she's in a 130 gallon tank now and she's happy. Uh, you know, I, I won't ever, you know, I mean, hell we were feeding her salmon last night, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> she's happy. She, she's, oh yeah. She's happy. She's a happy, she's a happy camper. So yeah. Well, yeah. It's, I mean, you're exactly right. It's the, 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 you can't, you don't get much out of tearing a strip off a person. Typically people get into the animal and, and they just carry on for way longer than, than they, they needed to. They just keep it for way longer than they should have. And, you know, surrendering it, surrendering it is the best thing. Yeah. And, and I think some people are just scared, you know, they're scared to ask for help. Um, and, and they're embarrassed about it. And, and I tell people, I said, look, if you're going to surrender an animal to I've, 
all I'm going to ask is what's the history of the animal. That's it. I, I'm not here to berate you or anything else. Now, if I'm back here in two weeks picking up something else because you're a reptile flipper, yeah, you and I are going to have some words. But, you know, for, for the most part, I, you know, I mean, I, I once again, it's I do what's in the, in the animal's best interest. And what's in the animal's best interest is to walk out the door with them. You know, I mean, as much as I'd like to grab that person around the neck and throw them up against the wall and tell them, you know, you should never own another animal again. You just can't do that. You know, I mean, not only is illegal, but it's just, it's, (laughs) I, I gotta take the high road. I mean, I really do. Well, and, and it kind of links back to, I think, the success of the Facebook group. Back to the Chameleon Central is I think I think that mentality is what gives the group success. It's like, yeah, sometimes you're going to have to be tough and, and, and remove somebody or whatnot. But most of the time, the high road is what actually builds a foundation of, of, of success. And, and it allows a, a 23,000 people to function in somewhat harmony. And, and in the end, the animals are going to thrive because of it. Yeah. And, and it's... Uh, that's exactly what happens. And that's what our goal is. Our goal is, is that, you know, we, we're going to do what's best for the animals. That's always there. And, and, you know, it, when you mentioned the 23,000 and, and you can go through and you can look at this, you know, we, I could look at, you know, analytics on the, on the group and, uh, it, there's, there's like over 80,000 comments and reactions over 3000 posts. This is every 28 days. There'll be up to, 15, 16,000 active members. I mean, so, you know, just because you've got a huge number doesn't mean that you really have all that many active members, but I mean, at least half are active um, on a consistent basis. And that's, uh, you know, I don't have, you know, privileged information to look at analytics from other groups. I mean, but I, my guess is that's pretty damn good, you know? Oh, yeah. I would say 50% plus is probably on the very, very high end for sure. I would think so. I would think that we are, you know, we're way up there, which is, that's awesome. I mean, it just, once again, it shows you the quality of the group. It shows you the quality of the people um, who are participating. So maybe as we wrap up here, I think we've kind of covered some of these points already, but if you, if someone wanted to start a group today, what are a few just pieces of advice that you would give them? Because it would be ama- amazing if we could have, you know, a good chameleon group and a good ball python group, heaven forbid, and, and a good, you know, so on and so on. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, the biggest thing is, 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 you know, build yourself a good admin team um, that maintains consistent, good um, communication like we do. Um, and, and don't be scared. You don't have to add experts in. I mean, there are people with PhDs that have absolutely zero social skills. They can't, you know, can't deal with people. Uh, and, and honestly, when you think about it, how many people are really experts in, in the reptile world? Most of us are hobbyists. I mean, that's what we are. Most of us yeah. are hobbyists, the vast majority of them. Because quite frankly, you know, being a herpetologist doesn't pay crap either. So <laughs> how many people that, you know, with the intelligence level to go get a PhD and, and have a degree in herpetology and all that stuff, they're, they're not in it for the money because it's not there. They do it for the passion, but there's so few people that do that. So surround yourself with people that are good with handling other people. Um, that's the key. The key is, is that you got to have people that are good at managing other people and tactfully steering people in the right direction. I don't know everything and I will be the first person to tell you on a group. If someone asks me a question and I say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I probably do know someone that does know the answer. So I'm going to point you in their direction or I'm going to ask them and then I'll get back with you. And that gives you a hell of a lot of credibility doing that. Um, If you're just going to go out there and you're going to spout out, stuff, things that you really don't have experience with, you're going to get, you're going to get shot down. You know that, you know, I, you've seen it dozens of times and, and that's never going to end. I mean, you know, the guy who's been on there for six months and is a self-proclaimed ball Python expert, you know, uh, it's, it, it's, it takes years. I mean, and, and it doesn't necessarily take time. It takes, um, 
it takes the right mentality and the willing to learn, willingness to learn and uh, that type of stuff. Cause look, I mean, I got a group with 23,000 people and I've been doing reptiles for six years. You know, I mean, I, I, people say, well, God, you probably been, you know, you were probably dragging snakes out of the, you know, out of the Creek when you were six years old. No, I wasn't <laughs> not at all. Yeah. 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 And that's the amazing thing. You're, you're right. It does just take the correct mentality and, and and that's a, what you what you said is a really good point is you don't have to come off as if you're an expert in what you're talking about and that's one of the things that people especially people on YouTube and whatnot they get to this mode where it's like they feel like they can't make a mistake and they feel like no matter what they need to have the answer to everything it's like actually you don't because you you clearly don't because nobody does and you're right you give you have way more credibility by saying hey actually I'm not sure I'd, let me talk to a few people I'll give you some contacts and they can get back to you and we'll figure this out together and then I'll know now. As a result of this, that's exactly it. And and when I taught classes in the army, I would and these were senior leadership classes. I said, I don't expect you to know all the technical portions of this job. What I do expect you to know is where to go find the answers. That's what I want you to do. And and that's the way you got to look at it because you can't you can't know everything. I mean, there's just absolutely no, no way you're gonna. But please learn where your resources are. Please make connections with people who do know. You know, have a person that's an expert in plants, have an expert that, you know, a person that's, a, you know, that's very well versed in uh, supplements or lighting or whatever it is. But uh, it's not necessarily that, you know, all of that stuff, but it's it is uh, vitally important that, you know, where to point someone to go get the information or where, you know, to go get the information. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's exactly right. Can can you let everybody know where they can find you online, where they can find the the group? And I think we've already mentioned the name at uh, Chameleon Central, but or is do you have an Instagram or anything? Uh, I, I do. I, I've got a Chameleon Central Instagram thing where I just literally pull uh, pictures off of the group that I think are kind of cool and stick them up there. So it's just Chameleon Central, uh, and then it's Chameleon Central on Facebook, and then you can look up Reeves Reptile uh, Rescue now. I, when the group first started, it was called Chameleon Central USA, and and we ended up with uh, we we were getting so many uh, and a lot of Canadians. We we're getting a lot of Canadian members. We were getting a lot of Mexican, uh, you know, pe- folks from Mexico um, and from other countries. And you know what I said? It, it's it's becoming more of a global group than anything. So um, you know, I put in uh, a name change, just dropped the USA off of it. Um, I've got a couple of, like I said, I've got a couple of Canadian admins. Um, so it, it's good to have resources spread out all over. Um, I would love to have some people in the UK. Um, the UK has got some, uh, they've got some good, um, chameleon groups and reptile groups. You know, there's, well, there's John Courtney Smith over there. There's Peter Hawkins. There's, there's several folks that, um, that are real prominent in social media that, that do a great job over there. Um, and a lot of times, Honestly, when when someone from the UK is on our group, I'll say, you know, this is this is a good place for you to be. But um, because the resources are different in the UK, I want you to join this particular group also. Or I want you to talk to Pete Hawkins or to John Courtney Smith, uh, because it, 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 the the um, supplies and all that kind of stuff that they get over there are not the same as what, you know, you and I are dealing with here, you know, on this side of the ocean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's definitely a difference. And and yeah, even just the care is always just even slightly different there. Oh, yeah. I mean, in in Europe, it's common to keep chameleons in glass. They keep them in vivariums, right? um, which there's nothing wrong with that, but they have access to a lot of different uh, vivariums that we don't here in the United States and and Canada. Uh, You just, you know, they, a big exoterra is 36 by, you know, 18 by 36. And that's a minimum that I would be looking at. But, you know, you talk to somebody in Germany and they'll tell you, you know, oh, I've got a glass vivarium that's, you know, it's twice that size. Um, but they, 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 they have people over there that make those vivariums and sell them. Exactly. Uh, well, Drew, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I think the, the information about social media was fascinating and also l- learning about how uh, passionate you are w- about the animals, obviously, with the rescue and everything is, is, is truly inspirational for one. So uh, I appreciate you coming on. So thank you so much. Yeah, and, and it's been great. I enjoyed it. And and the first time I heard you, I was like, I got to contact this guy because he's <laughs> well, like, like I said, you, you got the same philosophy as I do. And, and so this this turned out great. 
And that brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you very much for listening. And Drew, thank you so much for spending the hour with me. I, that was an amazing conversation. I think it's going to be an incredibly important resource for people because as I said at the very, you know, in the intro, Facebook is something that we can utilize and it, it can be very beneficial, although it's not being used correctly in a lot of, in a lot of cases. And this will give a really good foundation and a good sort of roadmap for people to use it properly. So if you are somebody that is interested in starting a Facebook group or is in a Facebook group right now and you're just not happy with the way it functions, I challenge you, go create a Facebook group. If you have a species that you keep or a type of animal that you have that that you'd like to have a group on, go create a group or I guess maybe make sure there isn't a group already out there that's uh, a good group. But if 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 you know there are no good groups out there, go create one. I would love to come be a part of it even if I don't have the species that uh, that you're particularly talking about in the group. I think it would be amazing for the industry to have more and more of these really positive positive, supportive groups that actually allow people to learn to care for animals properly. So we will wrap up this episode. Again, I really encourage everybody to participate in the hashtag better care challenge. If you do post a video or a picture on Instagram, definitely tag me in it or use the hashtag better care challenge so I can see it and I will post it in my story. I'm super excited about the amount of people that are already participating in this and I know you can be one of them as well. So please do that. If you are enjoying the show, definitely go check out animalsathome.ca slash shop. You can pick yourself up a t-shirt there and $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And of course, thank you very much to our sponsor, customreptilehabitats.com. Again, go check out the video that Emily has posted when they go down to Universal Rocks. You get to meet Paul, the owner of Custom Reptile Habitats. And of course, links to the website are in the description as well as the show notes. I'll talk to you guys next time.